So we are here again in Women Matters of the Wisdom Factory .net. And today we have the title Telling the Truth is a Casualty of War. It is the consequence of what we talked the last two times where we were talking about cleaning up our collective history. It was about the German and Austrian and Jewish uh, past. And we had some very interesting um, conversations about that. And I invite you to watch them. So this time, telling uh, the truth is a casualty of war. Uh, before I ask you what that actually mean for the English speaking people, I want to ask you all to introduce yourselves. I start, I'm Heidi in Italy, and I'm the founder of the Wisdom Factory. And I'm living yes, here in Italy, which finally is a little bit warmer and then it was all uh, May long. And yeah, I just coming back from South Africa from the Integral Conference and the Integral Tour and it was very exciting. And the potentiality of war was very obvious, especially when we visited the Apartheid Museum and saw some um, historic connections. So far with me and I give over to who wants to come next. Okay, I come next. I'm Monia from Vienna, Austria, central of Europe. And we right now are suffering through a heat spell and trying to get used to the climate change. I am lucky I live on the outskirts of Vienna and we have lots of trees and gardens there. So we manage. But in the city, it's terrible. Um, yeah, how am I checking in today? I'm reading a book about that whatever it is, is just in your mind. And you are walking through your projections. And that's quite an interesting thought for me. Uh, so whatever happens to me, it's generated in myself because consciousness wants to experience it. And yeah, with regard to truth, that's probably also a very interesting topic. I'm passing on to whoever wants to speak next. I'm Dorothy and I live in uh, Oregon on the Oregon coast. I'm looking out at the Pacific Ocean. It's flat and blue. Um, our weather is lovely. There's, there's no enormous heat. And um, I'm looking forward to our conversation because it seems to me there's so many different ways uh, of perceiving uh, everything. And as Moni just said, um, who knows what's projection, who knows what's reality. Um, to me, what's important is what I feel, what I experience, what my heart um, tells me. And um, this subject of the silence, I can't remember exactly what uh, Luna suggested, but um, looking at our history, keeping our history clear in our, our minds so that the lessons, the pain uh, doesn't disappear and we wipe our hands. Okay, that's over now. So I'm looking forward to seeing where the four of us go with a topic as vast and as personal as this that we're going to discuss. And yeah. I can't see everyone. I don't know how to see everyone. I can only see Moni. But that's okay. nice. Too. That's nice too. <laughs> you have to scroll on your tablet and then you see the others to, to, to wipe. And then you can see the others too. Probably. That's the problem with the mobile devices that you cannot see everybody. Yeah, that's okay. I'll, I can see you. And when you come on, I can see you. I just can't see the circle. Okay. okay. 
Okay, so I'm Victoria Duda from Hungary. I'm in Budapest and I'm sharing Monia's terrible heat wave. But it got a li little bit better actually in the last two days. Um, it was pretty inhuman before that. Um, but I was thinking actually listening to the news, we should not complain hearing that they have over 50 degrees somewhere in India like an all-time world record of heat and people don't even have water there. So I think it can get a lot worse. And uh, well, I'm a hypnotherapist and uh, have been here a couple of times. It's always very interesting and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion this evening. And you, Heidi, you said you came from the Integral Conference in South Africa and I'm heading tomorrow to the Integral summer meeting, Sommertreffen in Germany. And that is something I'm super, super excited about. Doubly so, also for the Integral and meeting some friends from last year. But also because it will take me back to where I grew up in Halle and the Harz Mountains in Germany. So that's going to be quite special. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. So the English speaking native speakers uh, about you, which I think is only Dorothy, but halfway also Victoria. What does it mean, the title, Telling the Truth is the Casualty of War? That's what, was, uh, what Luna said, and we, I caught it, and I thought it's a good title, but I actually wouldn't know what she meant with that. So uh, what is your impression, Dorothy? What might that mean? Well, I, you know, you said, Heidi, you went to the apartheid um, museum and um, that, that war, that, that terrible period um, is being remembered. And I think that if things are remembered, if history is kept, um, if we stay connected with history instead of wiping it out, then it isn't a casualty of war. Uh, I went to a Unitarian service this uh, Sunday uh, because in Portland it's Gay Pride Week and um, all the gay and transgender and all the people of various uh, dimensions of their sense of who they are uh, march and it's enormous. And on the stage of the um, uh, church, was a group of transgender people. So you couldn't see if they were men and women. It, it, they were just like people who sang really beautifully. And the minister's speech was about uh, the pride of, the, of, of surviving um, what those people must have gone through as children, with their parents in school, with their peers. And they were victorious up there with their striped socks, singing songs that meant something to them a cappella. And he talked a lot about, you know, how that pride isn't one of the deadly sins, but it rather elevates people up through and demonstrates that their history doesn't have to hold them down. And he talked about a, an ahistorical approach to living, sort of that moving on, okay, there's no more lynchings, now we can go on, oh, okay, eight million people aren't being exterminated, now we can move on. And he really made the point that um, if, if you let what, is, what has happened and what still is a huge potential in human beings, then you make yourself even more vulnerable and you don't pick up the gauntlet of rising, rising above that and maintaining a new level of humanness. And that's what not having a casualty of war um, be a reality in our society is, is the ability to look at the history and use that as part of the ladder uh, where we rise. And that was why the saying, I'd, I'd like to read the saying if I could, because I think vulnerability 
running from it is a way of not looking, not looking, okay, we're done with that, never again. And I don't think that's true. I, I, I don't think most humans have evolved yet to where that kind of hatred and that kind of destruction isn't still a large potential. So I'm gonna read this by David White, one of my favorite poets. To run from vulnerability is to run from the essence of our nature. The attempt to be invulnerable is the vain attempt to become something we are not. And most especially to close off our understanding of the grief of others. And I think that many times to protect ourselves, we say, okay, time to move on. And I don't think we can get away with that. And that I think becomes a casualty of war. <laughs> that was a pontification. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you, that makes, makes it a little clearer for me. Anya or Victoria, what would you say? Yeah, well, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead, it's okay. <laughs> Are you going to remember what you wanted to say? Okay. So I, I, I think this is a very interesting uh, point that what, what, what is it that becomes the casualty? That I remember Dorothy's original question that uh, we were talking about at the end of last session where she asked, like, why is it always the Jewish people? Um, and I, I have to admit, I was thinking about that a lot ever since. And I was thinking it is very similar to why there's certain people. Um, I remember the book from Hermann Hesse, who wrote uh, Damian, which you probably all read, that he's retelling the Cain and Abel story. And he says that Bible is already twisting it because in the original story, uh, Cain was not necessarily a murderer, but he was someone special. And people can sense that. And the big masses of people, they sense out someone who's different, someone who's special and feel threatened by that. And they tend to attack that that person and i think it's no uh, it's it's no accident that humanity has murdered most of their great spiritual teachers because if someone is standing out of the crowd and and is something special then the the big masses who are not on that level of evolution yet feel threatened by it and, and tend to murder it so i was thinking of the the in the Bible, when it says that the Jewish people are God's uh, chosen people, I, I think that has a lot to do with that. That I think also people, like as in nations, carry certain karma, to put it like that. So probably as a nation, as a people, the Jewish people carry that sort of specialness, that sort of that sign. And like individuals who are special, who are different, who are artistic, who are spiritual, who are carrying a message that is not yet the message of the masses. And they get, they tend to get murdered and they tend to get uh, attacked. I think it's sort of, it could be like a sort of uh, group karma of the Jewish people, if that makes sense. I would like to come in here too, because the specialness of Jewish people, as I have understood, is that they are collectively very good in what they are doing. There are researches uh, about their, uh, in, um, how do you say, um, nah, intelligence quotient, which is uh, extremely high in comparison to how, how few people there are. So that, that makes uh, envy in people. When, you, when they are good in it uh, and we are not so good in it, then there must be something wrong with them. And so we are envious and we better, so instead of elevating ourselves, you know, to that level, we as humans normally try to push down the others. And I, I think it's such a, 
intrinsic human trait to to the envy thing and so sometimes it goes up to to murder no and as the collectively they are so good in what they are doing i don't know why but it is the fact that i'm not wondering why this specialness is creating murderous ideas you know because of our human shadow which we haven't worked on yet but that monia you wanted to say something um, well, I just wanted to return to the topic that truth is a casualty of war. And the first th thing that came to my mind is that history is always written by the winners. Those who win a war, they tell you their view of what happened. And it has taken many, many decades uh, that now our generation, uh, who the children of that war, finally make up their mind to be heard as well. Uh, and many aspects, particularly of World War Two, and I guess also of World War One, but my concern is more World War II. Uh, many perspectives are different from the other side. Um, what I, what really struck my mind was when uh, Notre Dame was burning and all of a sudden I remembered how Dresden was planned to burn uh, by bombing uh, it is a in a special way so that the people who lived there, and there were civilians, they were not soldiers, suffocated in this, because there was no more air, it was all pulled up. And I remember that cross of the church uh, that they now put on a side altar, and uh, it was all... Yeah, it was spent and and that really struck me. And so these these they are these are experiences I had never as a child. Uh, but it's obviously in the collective uh, the horror of war. And those who lead a war, like Hitler did, they never tell the people the truth. They were losing many, many battles already and still claimed that they were winning. So this must, can maybe also be the truth is the first casualty of war. It's in the media and it's in the state media and you won't get the truth at all about your situation and about the situation of how things are developing. This is a very... Uh, simple and down to earth uh, explanation of this of this uh, of our title for today no psychology there yet but yeah yeah thank you and i think what you are saying we can uh, observe now in real time no with these tankers in in the mm -hmm. in, uh, in the arabian gulf or yemen mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. It looks again like the old tactic how to start a war by giving right. somebody else the blaming skill. somebody else yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and feeling yeah. this as a justification to to bring their own troops and start well, and America was good in that, Germany was good in that, probably all nations are good in all that. Military, and, all military and, and invested interest and so yeah. And it's not the truth which is creating the war, but uh, fake news or fake truth. Fake, or fake news. It was fake news. Well, news are fake news most of the time. So that's, it's the first time that we really name that and label it at, as what it is. It's fake news. And uh, Bush already. Oh, but what came to my mind now is that the military calls 
their department is department defense department. So everybody defends themselves all the time. They never are never aggressors. No, no. And uh, yeah, that's also f that's not the truth. That's a lie. Fake it's, truth. <laughs> no, it's 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 just a simple, a blatant lie. And uh, yeah. But it's not, it's also in, in German, in, in Austrian, it's a Verteidigungsministerium. So it's, yeah, we always defend ourselves and we never are aggressors. Uh, <laughs> okay, for, so far for truth. It's funny yeah. if, you, if you put it like that, Monia, that I was thinking that war is per definition a lie. Because if you, if you think about it, what it is, it's every war implies that in order to get our cause across, we have to kill people. And that is always a lie. Because in order to get your cause across, you shouldn't be killing any people. So if it's war, it is a lie. And... Uh... I'm also thinking now about how war uh, helps economy. So uh, it's not just dealing with weapons, which is still done to both warring sides. The countries deliver their weapons so they can really kill each other. And this is also, oh, it just makes me furious. And it's one of my the topics, the military industrial complex that helps keep the economy of a, of a country. And whenever uh, there is no way to use up weapons, a new war is somewhere created. Is my, of, over the last decades, my impression. And mostly people who don't, uh, it's like, Oh, in German, we call them, oh, the barefoot, the bloßfüßigen. So people who don't have really the experience of warring or they are back in the Middle Ages in their kind of war. And yeah, so the, there is no truth at all in war. Yeah. Yes. And then the truth is that nowadays we try to keep our economy by exporting uh, weapons. And the war, please do it somewhere else. Somebody else can die, you know. So in some way, it was a, a truth that in Europe, the war has killed ourselves, <laughs> not the others, at least uh, for that time, you know. So mm -hmm. now we try to export it and have other people suffer. And then we can go and be magnanim magnanimous, you say, and send some uh, help and, you know, whatever. That I think it is meant often uh, from the heart to, 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 to give people the help to reconstruct and whatever. But the fact that they have, that they are in this situation that we first have created, mm, mm, I don't know. Well, not just created, but also uh, supported and uh, Austria uh, produces terrific guns and, and that uh, people, and I think even the American military or police use them because they are very lightweight and uh, yeah. Uh, but we are a very neutral, peaceful country. That is actually very interesting how it exposes layers of lies. Because when you just said that sentence, Munia, that a war is good for the economy, I was just like, ooh, that sentence hurts, right? It's a painful sentence to even say it out loud. And it exposes the lies that just because something is helping the economy doesn't mean it's a good thing. And, and the other thing that comes to my mind is when people say like, oh, but you can't stop something because it is creating jobs. And I always hate that sentence. I was like, oh, Auschwitz created jobs. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't mean that because something is creating jobs, it's a good thing. 
the two are not related. Horrible things can be jobs. Uh, horrible things can help the economy. So it, it, we, we should rethink that just because something is helping the economy, just because something is creating jobs, it's not necessarily a good thing. We have to ask what kind of economy is it helping? What kind of jobs is it creating? But and this was the economic situation when Hitler came because people had no jobs, they had no, they were hungry. Exactly. And he was the one who promised them and he, he not only promised, he delivered it. He built uh, streets, he built roads, he built autobahn, he built, yeah, people, people had money all of a sudden just to survive. And that's what's so terrible about it. And, uh, when I look at it, that the people uh, being just thrilled by Hitler's occupying Austria, that was the official statement, uh, they hoped for, yeah, they hoped for jobs and they hoped for, they didn't hope for uh, killing most of the Jewish population. They didn't hope for that. They were not even for some time aware of it, but it helped their situation at that time between the wars. And of course, this goes back to World War I. This situation was caused by many of the uh, contracts, the, uh, the world or the winners, there we are again, the winners decided upon after World War I, and this kept people in their poverty at that time. But yeah, it's as Heidi said, it's a very human trait uh, to think for just your own survival and not worry about the survival of others. Yeah, and in this case, it's even um, a little bit different because people get, uh, let's say, bribed they get really light uh, on completely because uh, they get promised jobs. But at the end, there are also fake jobs in many ways, you know, because the, the money was not really there and is not really there, but it is a construction to, to have people agree and to, 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 to get people into the net, let's say, into the, into the trap. And then uh, that's still what they do today, you know, the political parties or whatever, like we have in the country of Dorothy, you know, they, somebody promises all sorts of things and then people uh, jump onto the boat. And what then comes out afterwards, oh, we didn't know, you know, or maybe, no, he, he will do it sooner or later, you know, things like that. So we, we are all the time light on and we are happy to be light on because this is also a human trait. We want to have hope. We want to have uh, something to look forward to. And if somebody is then promising this, if it is real, um, doable or not at the end and what consequences it is, we, we don't think so far. We just stick <laughs> to this little bit oh, of... I understand what you said. You, we enjoy being light too. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what you meant, yeah. Maybe not enjoy, but it is sort of a need, like we say in Stroheim in German, no? where, where you can... Uh, last straw, the last yeah. straw to hold on to. Hold yeah. On. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, some some sort of uh, yeah orientation, which we otherwise wouldn't have. So I think it is an abuse of, 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 of what is happening by who has, for one reason or other, the power to do so. But we're also I... abusing ourselves. Sorry, others here. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, well, I always have to bring in the psychological aspect to everything. Um, I think from, you know, all that you're saying is, and it's, is that I think this, this, um, uh, capitalism as God and the promise and survival and getting jobs and all that. I think there's too many of us and I think our technology is too devastatingly developed uh, for us to get away with this for much longer. 
And I think the whole climate crisis is connected to the disregard for what it's costing our planet, what it's costing our spirit to prevail in this level of uh, functioning of power and um, capitalism and um, big weapons. I, I just think it's going to take us down. And as hard as we work here, and my husband just got $10,000 from our city council to start putting out more information about the risks and what the community should begin to do, because we really feel like uh, things are going to get very, very bad, and there will not be food enough, and there will not be water enough, and the air will be polluted, and you'll all be hot and looking for shopping centers. And I just think that we're paying the price now. And maybe in World War I, the world could get away with it. But it's everywhere. And people like Trump and people like in Hungary and, you know, stupid, maniacal people are now calling the shots. And I just think our, our civilization, I'm pretty fatalistic, uh, is going to pay for it. And I don't know how we can wake up. I don't know how you transform nation states where just a few women talk on uh, Tuesday morning about, you know, how heartbreaking it is for them. You know, who else is talking about it? <laughs> you know, who, no one that says make America great again is talking about it because they're wearing their red caps and they're waiting for their jobs, like you're all saying. But it, you know, the world is too full. The, the ocean is too warm. You know, the, the fish around here are filled with cigarette butts and pop cans. I mean, it's really a bad time for the human being. And I think it's pretty hard to be abstract about it, but I sort of feel an inevitability that we're gonna pay for this uh, direction that the human animal has taken. We got off the track. And I think maybe we're going to have to start over again, or just a few of us. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not a doomsday person. I'm a 100% optimistic person. But listening to you talk about the political stuff and the history of our culture and seeing where we're headed and who's in charge makes me think maybe we do need a clean slate, a tabula rasa and start again you know maybe we're dinosaurs and we got too big and stupid and we can't stay anymore no matter how many meditations we do or how much past life or how many clients we help or you know i don't know it seems like just a drop in a big dirty bucket oh it so resonates what you're saying dorothy i was just thinking today that um it's not that I read the Bible. I think I'm quoting the Bible the second time today. <laughs> Never even read it. Okay. We won't make any assumptions. <laughs> but I pick up stuff. Yeah? And, and one of them was in the Apocalypse. Uh, it's, it says somewhere that, that when, when the do doom is coming, it's characterized by the fact that you can't be a good human being anymore. It's impossible. So everybody's contributing to, to the doom. And, and that's something that I feel ever increasingly, that no matter what you're doing, you're doing it wrong. You know, you're trying to do something right. Like, I don't know, everybody's doing a different thing, but I'm like trying to be a vegan, to not to contribute to, to the horrible treatment of animals. And then you try to be saving on uh, fuel, that I try to drive my car as little as possible and, and so on and so on. And then I, today I read about the, the electronic cars, you know, people who really want to be good to the environment, they are investing a lot of money in buying the electronic cars. And now I'm going to make you sad because I just watched this documentary where electronic cars, just as much as the mobile phones, they need some sort of, I, I forgot what it is, but, but that they mine in the Congo. So what is it? A battery. They need yeah, battery. uranium or something. I, I forgot what it is, but some sort of mineral that they are mining. It's, it's all in the Congo, and they are sending little children into the mine, and it's destroying their lives. So you're like... <laughs> right, right. 
and it's with everything you know the more you you're trying to to work your way out of of contributing to unspeakable evil and then you're just discovering that you're contributing to another unspeakable evil and and that's my friend Chris always says it has to get worse before it gets better. So he's very optimistic. And I say, like, I don't believe in that anymore. And that's um, World War II is showing that, you know, I mean, if that got so bad, if, if that doesn't wake up people, then nothing will. You know, it, it can't get worse than 20, 20th century history. You can't. I mean, how much worse do we want it? And oh, it, it, can, we it can get worse. Well. Sorry? It can get worse. There are some people who have the power to press the button, and then we are gone, everybody more or less. So that's. Yeah, maybe it's quantitatively worse, but morally it can't get worse. Everything has been done evil that can be done. But yeah, it can quantify. Yeah, that's only an a it happen in a bigger quant scale. But amplification. Worse, it can't get. I don't think mm -hmm. So what I think is important and how I live my life, even though I drive an electric car and I know there's, you know, hazards and, you know, like you, Victoria, and I'm sure like all of us, you know, I do everything in my power spiritually and uh, societally and, you know, to be responsible. And I think we'll be, there are lights of that happening. I think there are, you know, poets that continue writing and, and thinkers that continue thinking. But I think the big wave of it includes more people and more power who don't have the, the commitment to life that we have. And, you know, I still feel good about my day and my crystals and my meetings and um, you know, my learning Spanish, I think we still can keep uh, alive and uh, offering forth what we know and what we have, but um, there's, there's not as many of us, um, there are a lot, but not as, as I think we need to turn the, the tide of where mankind and civilization is headed. That's, that's what I think. And, I, you know, I don't dwell on that. And I, don't, I have friends that look haggard and who wake up at night and, and, you know, who are doing things kind of desperately to make things better. But I'm just staying in my um, area of control and trying to pull my energy out of my area of concern. Um, and, you know, manifesting as much positivity and love and you know goodness as i can you know kind of ironing out a lot of the dark wrinkles you know in my own soul and in my own heart and that's totally for me uh satisfying and exciting and um i'm okay you know i'm 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 really okay i'm not going out too far and reading about the children in the Congo, uh, Victoria, that are in the mines, you know, I mean, I could read it, but we've cut off all news, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's a, if it's a, if it's an ethical thing to do. I mean, the news I go to is what the Unitarians who are Universalists have to say, or what David White says, or, you know, the music that Bill writes and we sing. I, I, we, I've canceled my New York Times, I've canceled my Washington Post, I, you know, Facebook sometimes, I have to go fast past Trump and people. So I'm, I'm in a cocoon. I, and I guess at 77, it might be okay to be semi-cocooned, and maybe you younger people are supposed to be out there doing other things, but I feel like I'm doing the right thing. That's my report. <laughs> I can, I can relate to that because I think what you are doing, the shadow work thing and to, how do you, did you say, to ironing out the wrinkles of my own... Uh, Dark soul. Yeah, I think this is so important. And if everybody did that, we wouldn't have to, to straighten a lot of things in the outside world because that would come 
by itself. And sometimes I actually doubt if by all goodwill, which we do in the outside world, if we really make a huge difference, we can make some difference, but it's not so really lasting. I heard that in, in South Africa that um, the governments try to impose from, from top and people in, in purple, they don't want that. And what is uh, now coming up and which they said is, is, is a hopeful uh, development that the people themselves begin from the bottom up to create the structure. For instance, in the, in the city, in inside city of, of Johannesburg, it was extremely crime and whatever, and very unsafe. I mean, they still said, don't show your camera, don't show diamonds or something, uh, because you will just be stopped and asked to give it away. But it didn't happen. But they told us, and we could also see that, that now they have sort of subdivided among themselves, there are mainly black people living there, no? uh, uh, the, the quarters, and they patrol them themselves. There is no police. You hardly ever see a police. I think I know, yeah, maybe once or twice, but there is also no police defending yourself when somebody robs you. you know? So they begin to do it from the bottom up and control their own areas and make sure that they are safe and that uh, you know nobody uh, transgresses from outside and they sort of uh, share the the task among themselves of maybe a block of, of, of the city, you know, and then the other block does that as well. So it seems to be a hope that structure can be created from the people themselves. I don't know why I say that now, uh, in, in which connection that was. Oh, yeah, because the outside, uh, the, the, the attempt to impose something on people who are not willing to, to, to do that, is, it's very, you know, questionable because it won't have uh, the effect. But when you do it from your inside impulses, Heidi, you are frozen. I don't know what happened, uh, but I'll just try to bridge that gap. Uh, can everybody hear me? The interesting internet with the telephone because... Oh, there she is. Yeah. There she is again. Yeah. Okay, okay it welcome was, back. <laughs> yeah. It is my telephone. I'm using internet with a telephone and as soon as the call comes, then uh, it, it shuts down everything else. So, mm -hmm. so you know, what I wanted to say, but anyway, something that we have the responsibility to, to really see inside and what it is really for us and from there create something instead of, I mean, demonstrations are fine, but up to a certain point, what really do they uh, change, you know? The change for me comes always from inside and then it goes out. Uh, Dorothy mentioned her age, and I'm of the same age, uh, but I'm a mystic. So my experience was many decades ago in 1973, that the whole planet is one consciousness, one living pulsing consciousness, and we all share this one consciousness. So, what does this consciousness want? It wants to experience us, uh, how we are happy, how we suffer. Um, somehow, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about doomsday or... Uh, I do what I can to support the climate, uh, my ecological footstep, I keep it rather small. We hardly drive, I uh, use public transportation since I live in a city. Um, I separate my garbage so it can be recycled. Uh, and I try to eat seasonable food that's homegrown and not uh, products from Chile or <laughs> wherever they are coming from. 
but I'm not worried. I'm not worried uh, because whatever happens, happens. And we ha what I'm trying to be is to be alert if there is really willful evil um, to oppose that. But on the other hand, I know whatever you oppose gets more energy. So this is one of the dilemmas, the psychological dilemmas I'm working with right now. But I'm not worried about the future. I just live where I am right now in the present. And this is an awareness I cult have been cultivating for a long time just to be present wherever you are, whatever you do. When you eat, you eat. When you walk, you walk. And when you sit down, you sit. And there is nothing to improve actually for us. Uh, to improve ourselves or the world or the situation is kind of hybris. It's, uh, yeah, power. We don't, none of us. None of us four has power uh, as politicians do. And politicians come and go. Only the queen stays there in, in, in England. She, will, she has survived so many polit uh, chancellors and presidents. And yeah. So that was my <laughs> talk <laughs> about um, consciousness. And this, this is what I was asking. If the inside and the outside are the same, so what are we projecting outside? The heat wave now? Um, yeah. So maybe we all have to cool down a little and things will develop the way they want to develop. Hmm. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Uh, about the cocoon Dorothy mentioned. Maybe I have a spiritual cocoon, but I'm happy to have it. I guess my, uh, my focus isn't as spiritual. I, I mean, I don't know if these words are so daunting to me. Mine is psychological and like Heidi, um, you know, responded to, um, I had parts of me that were, you know, like difficulties from the world at large that I've assumed responsibility for in terms of uh, opening my heart wider and embracing more. I, I, part of my legacy, part of what I inherited from being Jewish or being an outsider or being the daughter of two parents who lost everything were things that were like rocks and they were obstacles for connection. And I'm, I'm, I'm a person of connection with human beings. That's, that's, that's my priority. I love being with other human beings. And I guess I'm not as much just with, a, I don't know if I'm with spirit or not, but maybe I am. Victoria might know more about that for, about me. But what my, my work that's the most exciting for me, um, and I'm never in a cocoon about this, is really remove, understanding, uh, respecting, and um, kind of uh, uh, making a place for these rocks, but m moving them out of the center uh, of my cosmic, spiritual, emotional path, my human path. So that, that's a big part of what I spend time doing, Moni, is uh, those, are, those are the dark wrinkles ironing those out because those caused me a lot of pain and I don't want to be 77 or 87 or dead and have all this pain to take with me. You know, I, I, I'd rather just heal it and recover and embrace and enjoy while I'm here. 
<laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> I, I feel something very similar. I feel like it's a paradox where <laughs> we are aware of the horrors that are going on around us and we don't do that sort of Strutzpolitik when we put our hand in the sand and pretend it's not there. But at the same time, while we are aware of the horrors, we are, uh, that, that, that's how I try to live. But at the same time, I live not in response to the horrors, but heading towards the very best place that I can just imagine. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I've been reading the Bible. Amen. <laughs> yeah. There is a little um, picture that I'm making at the moment and I would want to show you, but I can't lift it up yet because I'm gluing little letters on it. And if I lift it up now, they would all fall down, but it's going to be like a, like a board that I'm gonna hang on the wall. And it has a quote on it. And the quote is from the Gilgamesh epic, the oldest survived book. And it says, I think it's probably my favorite ever quote, and it illustrates what we were just talking about. It says, treasure the dream, whatever the terror. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I have to write that down. I'll show you when it's ready. I'll hold it up. <laughs> That's really good. I guess I mentioned that last time, uh, when we did some shadow work in our salon, uh, that the fact of having to die shouldn't keep one from living. And to live uh, the fact of terror and war around us shouldn't keep us from feeling joy and right. experiencing, yeah, not just pain, but also happiness and, yeah. Yeah, there's a profane uh, saying also, uh, which says you can never be poor enough to make somebody rich or less poor <laughs> in some way. What does that mean, Heidi? What does that mean to you? It means uh, when people try in our society to reduce everything to everything and become really poor, they don't make any poor person uh, happier. Or, but when you get unhappy yourself, you don't make anybody else happier. You make only yourself unhappy. Or when you impoverish yourself, you don't automatically bring somebody else out of poverty. You know, so that's, uh, you know what I mean? It, it's not self-understanding that when you reduce yourself, that you uh, give power to somebody else to, 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 to grow. Okay. Uh, the opposite is, uh, like for instance, parents uh, had this ideology that they have to sacrifice themselves for their children, no? Uh, that, that's not the case, no? When that's... Uh, <laughs> Intuitively, we know that, but there are also research on that that says the happier the parents are, the happier become the children. But when the parents uh, think they have to give up everything for their children, what, what a mess, you know, poor children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. In this yeah. sense, you know, you cannot uh, reduce your consumption of everything uh, to, the, to, the, to becoming really poor and, and live in caves. You, you don't have any real effect on, on the world's problems by doing that. That's what I meant to say. Well, because I was thinking this group of the four of us sharing our stories and sharing ourselves and, you know, offering, you know, the joys that bring us joy to each other. I mean, that's like you said, Moni, it makes everything right. You know, we're right here looking at each other from all these different corners and we're putting in a basket. I see a basket where each one of us puts in, you know, fruits and flowers and chocolates and, you know, vegetables and, you know, just kind of a richness of four women coming together to say, 
yeah, things are things are pretty, you know, pretty di difficult out there. But in our own hearts and souls and homes, you know, Victoria making her collage to remind herself. And um, today, when I, I just want to tell you, what I was when I did my run. Our son, who's thirty seven, is just buried in his work. I'm just a lost, lost millionaire soul, and it's just the most painful thing when I think about it. And I thought of making a collage for him for his birthday in September. And he's a Libra is his sign. And I'm going to make a big scale. Bill will draw the scale. And I'm going to put a symbol for his work on one side. And then I'm going to fill the other side of the scale with all the potential of his children and his parents and his his, his skiing and his soul and you know everything I can think of so that he can see something that shows him how important it is to stay balanced because he's totally out of balance. I don't know why I told you that. I'm just so excited to have thought of maybe something that'll, you know, help him come from that place of, of being consumed by uh, his work. Well, it's the age, the age group. It See? is, but he's got beautiful children and how long are his parents, you know, right. I know, I know, but I want to remind him because he is a wise soul and he's an old soul and he's just kind of gotten a little bit lost. I think he's hmm. forgotten. He's forgotten some things. I well, uh, it's almost an hour, Heidi. Uh, what about our topic of today? <laughs> How'd we do? I would uh, plead for always telling the truth and uh, not maybe not always, always when it's, you know, when you see that somebody cannot handle the full truth. So you, you, you don't say a lie at least, and you find a way to, to say mm -hmm. that that's for me the, the most important thing. And then as I'm German, I often say the truth in ways that some people get shocked by it because I don't wrap it up in golden paper, but I just say it. So in a sort of rational way. And I remember Mark, when he, we started our relationship, he sometimes was shocked by it, but then he got used to it and understood that it's not that I want to hurt people or something. I just say things as I see them. And at the end, it's the truth, you know? And some people obviously need to have a more, you know, a slower way to, if they want to go to the truth anyway, then you need to find an extra way. That's not really my gift, but anyway, if we can begin to tell the truth about things to each other, I think many things would be different. When we at least avoid to say lies, you know? Maybe not saying anything is better than saying lies. <laughs> mm. But my experience is that uh, if you try to spare people the truth, they, uh, they don't like that. They feel you don't take them as full, that they can stand it and they... Um, but what is truth? Uh, when we had a meeting of the Meridian University and everybody uh, contributed what they came for here and I came and I, and I said, and I didn't know, it just popped up. Uh, I came here for truth. Uh, and it's always a truth about yourself. Yeah. It's it's not about situations on the outside. It's how you yourself are true. And Buddhists have this beautiful saying uh, that you shouldn't deceive anybody and thus deceive yourself. And this is one of my, I haven't put it up, but it, it's my, I can repeat it. Like I repeat Rilke as I did before. <laughs> Very nice. And I still, I'm still hoping, Dorothy, that next time you can quote it in English, what I quoted in German. I'll do that it. Would be, that would be really, really interesting. Okay. Yeah. I thank you for contributing to a difficult topic. 
Yeah. Um, uh, uh, check, check out uh, still Dorothy and Victoria. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I feel reassured that our truth is not a casualty. We are not casualties of the war on nature or the war on spirituality or just the struggles that are going on that we're really candles and we're still lit and we're lit in different ways uh, different aromas different scents and um, I just feel very hopeful and um, grateful very grateful um, to have been here for this hour with the four three of you and that we could share so freely um, what we know, what we understand, who we are, what we hope for. I, it's very, very rich. Thank you. Just had this vision lately that I maybe the things that we perceive as cocoons. So there are people all around the world that seem to create their cocoons. They create beautiful places where there's a lot of art and there's a lot of soul and there's a lot of spiritual uh, beauty. And the vision that I got that maybe they are not even cocoons or another way to look at them is they are like cells, like a cells in a neurological network. And when we talk to each other, then we connect these cells, like the brain cells or the nerve cells. And then it's not just a little cocoon anymore. And it's not just one little cell anymore, but it's a network. And I think that it has the power to connect. Um, when I had this thought, I was reminded of that scene from the Lord of the Rings in the movie. There's this scene when they uh, light the, the fires on top of the mountains. I don't know whether you've seen that. So it's a, it's a communicate. Oh, it's a beautiful scene where they have on top of the mountains, they have light towers. So they light up the, the fire and then the, somewhere else, someone sees it and lights up a fire and it goes from one mountain top to the other mountain top and it becomes a chain. It's a beautiful scene with beautiful music and everything. And, and that's what I saw that our network can light up like that when it's needed. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the power of what we are doing individually. Because I think when we connect and one day maybe it will be required that we all connect as one, um, it can have tremendous, tremendous power. I'm, I'm always reminded of, um, I grew up in communism and how communism came down. And it was not a political decision. It was when everybody stood up and went out on the streets. Uh, not even as a revolution, but just as a, this is what we're doing, doing now. It was fake news. People thought that the, 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 it really was. I, I, I was watching a, a contemporary news and uh, in East Germany, they announced on TV that the parliament was deciding to open the borders. But that was complete fake news. It was a complete misunderstanding. It was just debating to put it up for debate. <laughs> They said in the news that it was fact and everybody stood up and went to the Berlin Wall. And what do you do if millions of people go out to the Berlin Wall? It's just a done deal. And I get that feeling that this can happen again. You know, when, when all our little networks connect and we stand up when we go out, it's, it will be it's, very powerful. Yeah, this is wonderful because uh, things happen when the time is, we say, ripe for, for, for them to happen. And we try to contribute to make it grow, the time grow in the sense to come to that point where, where this transformation or how we can call it uh, can happen. And yeah, thank you for contributing yeah. and see you next month. Bye. Yes, thank, thank you, Eddie. Bye to thank all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.